everybody. That's okay. That's okay. We'll roll with the punches. That's fine. We got a big Friday stream. I see chats blowing up. What's up, everybody? Happy to have you on the show today. Uh, as Ian said up top, uh, we got a big stream ahead of you. Uh, first things first, we're going to have on Tobias Forge, and then later we're going to have Paolo Nutini performing live on stream. Uh, but, you know, let's kick it off, y'all. Uh, I want you to welcome the front man and mind behind Ghost, whose album, Impera, as you know, has a nomination for favorite rock album of the year at the American Music Awards. Please, everybody, welcome Tobias Forge. Tobias. Hey. Hey, how are you are doing today? I'm, I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? Wonderful. Good. Thank you so much. I, I'm well. Thank you so much for being with us. I, I know you've had such a crazy day, possibly a busy day of travel, so thanks for sitting down with us for a little while. Well, I actually did most of my travels yesterday, so t today has been a long, mm. uh, jet-lagged mm. day. Oh, boy. Well, um, I hope we can uh, perk you right up. We have a lot of people here who are really excited to see you. Everybody's going crazy in the chat. Um, I, I was just wondering... Um, how have things been for you recently, especially since coming off that huge tour that you had, a year of tours? Uh, I saw you guys with Volbeat uh, back in February, uh, and then I saw y'all again uh, at UBS Arena recently with uh, Mastodon and Spirit Box. So it's been a crazy year of touring. Uh, how have you felt after that? It's been paced in a way that hasn't really worn us out, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. not in, in any way sort of hinting at that, that touring is a drag, but, um, for the most part of, of our career pre COVID, um, uh, touring was a lot more tight. We, we mm -hmm. did six weeks of touring. We went home for a week or two weeks and then there was another six weeks and it just sort of continued in, in this similar fashion throughout the one entire album cycle and then you made a new album and it sort of, sort of restarted uh which is you know that's very common when you're when you're building and and we're still building but as 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 a result of of uh, the actual shows being a little bit more um, ambitious i guess you're also putting another demand on everyone's time and attention and and funds i yeah. guess so you end up playing less the bigger you get the less you play yeah that's interesting so. i i think that that makes a lot of sense um because i think the shows have gotten really really great and so over the top and uh, i i really like going to see you guys every time i can get out to see y'all um I, I think i remember the first time you played barclay center uh i caught you there and uh taking you from a smaller stage or more of like a smaller venue to a large stage. Uh, was that an interesting transition for you in trying to figure out um, how to really structure that show out and do the whole thing uh, in front of that many people? I've always had uh, an, a, an, a feeling that I would like that format. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sounds crazy, but, but it's, you know, I, I, as many others, grew up on 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 a diet of rock from the 60s, 70s, 80s. And um, for the most part, a lot of the bigger than, you know, the, the, the larger than life bands, they were playing big places. So that was sort of the forum in which you saw the dream coming alive. Yeah. Um, and uh, as as professionality has sort of entered my world and you tour with other bands um opening up for other bands doing your own headline tours and then you open up for a band again and then you go back headlining uh you know slowly and steadily you you, you might get a taste or at least an, a hint of what it's like playing arenas or even stadiums and uh i'd say that as much as i you know as 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 much as you know, coming from from the underground, I, of course, I always like like a sweaty club show, mm -hmm. but from a perspective where the idea with Ghost has always been for a production, a show, which is usually not very, doesn't go very well with a with a confined space that is a club's stage. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always had, you know, playing larger places has always been sort of, I've magnet, I've gravitated towards that, and I find arenas to be sort of the happy medium you you know 
as much as you know, you know, as much as you know, I like the the cheer, um, grandioseness of outdoor shows and stadiums and stuff. You're when we've done that, um, uh, opening up for other bands. I think that the the one thing that I am not super thrilled about it. It's basically you're up against the elements. You're up against rain, wind, storms, um, cold, heat. In a way that in arenas you're you're it's pretty uh it's controlled yeah i like that much more controlled environment exactly um i think you hit on something very interesting in that uh, you kind of were supporting bands and then headlining some shows and then supporting again and then headlining i feel like um ghost is really now in a position that they do a lot of headlining shows nowadays uh, arena headlining shows which is uh, a fantastic trajectory uh, to be on i think and where you've gotten it's very impressive and uh for those shows now uh what do you think it really takes to be in a touring band like you are in right now that um knocks out arena shows all the time all over the country and all over the world hmm. um i think i mean i've always for you know I've always made sure that we always were a great band. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we maybe go, that goes without saying, I, I guess some would say, but like you, you really have to play very well and it needs to be a ve very well sounding orchestra. I think that that is like first and foremost. And I'm saying this just because I've uh, over the years of having seen many, 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 many concerts with different bands, I can, you know, honestly throw a lot of roses to bands that I've done really well, but also bands on really big levels that has done very poorly, you know, really phoning it in um, and, and, and basically given their, you know, 30% sort of <laughs> performance, <laughs> not mentioning any names. Um, but as a fan, I, I definitely took note of that and and remembered those shows as like, if I ever get the chance to play in front of that many people, never do that, ever. Always do your best. Um, and always make sure that, you know, that, you know, you have to, I guess I have the upper hand just because or me and and bands like mine that have like a an image where you can uh in a, in a in a different fashion than others sort of view your band from an outside point of view um i try to do with ghost everything that i want to see other bands do or other bands like like a band that i want want to see um and um maybe i can do that with a slight more of a attention to detail with a slight slightly more defined uh objective than if we were just like go up on regular stage like uh street clothes on stage singing about very mundane things mm -hmm. uh you know real you know sort of the real sort of bands which i love at all also mm -hmm. but I think that since everything with Ghost is so uh, focused on show and entertainment, and uh, just because I've sort of taken myself out of the equation, it's it's easier for me to see like how things should be in order to, like, uh, not a dull not for for there not to be a dull moment. My jet lag is sort of kicking in, so that's <laughs> that. Thus the aphasia. Sorry. No problem. Um, I just got a coffee here. Thank you. Very oh much. wow, that'll Thank cure you. some jet lag for you. That's yeah. great. Um, talking about those shows that you're playing now, um, and how you want to put on a show that you would want to see. And uh, I think that ghost is a very entertaining band live, a lot of performance there. And I think that's really key in keeping people engaged and entertained throughout the show. Um, for you personally, um, have there been times in the past year, or the past few years where you've been hypercritical about your shows or a time that you saw one of your shows or went through one of your shows and thought that could have been a lot better and I want to refine it for next time. Every show that we've ever done. Wow. <laughs> wow. No, I, I, for the, um, for the sake of not feeling 
like um, we're underperforming. I do not spend a whole lot of time after a show pondering of what we just did. Mm-hmm. Um, I know some people do that. I, and fortunately for some people in, in the team, we have a few people that are, are like that, that would s- sit after the show and just like go through every moment. Uh, and I, I, uh, I sort of lean on, on their view, say that, is there anything that really go like, is there something that we need to address? Mm-hmm. But I don't want to sit, uh, constantly on tour watching our show. Mm-hmm. I try to sort of do that in the beginning of the tour. And then once we're rolling, it's, it's, um, it's more of a, a team effort. You get me, I don't know what to compare it to, but you know, it's, it's like being a big team of there. It's such, so it, when it sort of goes beyond the design and the idea, when everybody knows what they're doing, um, it's, it's a, very much a teamwork that requires 30 40 people to work in tandem synchronizing with an enormous amount of cues Mm -hmm. like if you count every cue that every person has i always try to do that and i always try to encourage people to think like me not to like don't ever think you can just enough is great but don't beat yourself up because if you manage to nail 80% of yours and most people did 80, 90, 95, like the sum of the whole show was still like great, right? Or what did we have to cut the show in, in the middle and just turn the lights on and everybody left mm-hmm. and everybody asked for refunds? That That's a, that's a shit show. Yeah. But right. just because you missed your guitar solo or... Uh, or the the follow spot guy sort of did a little bit of a search or or something like that. Shit happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. absolutely. I think um, going off that, what you just said, I, I you know we had Spirit Box on the show a few months ago, and they were in the midst of, or they just finished uh, their tour uh, with you and uh, with Mastodon. And mm. when I asked them about how that experience was for them, they said, "Oh my god, like the 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 people that put on the show for Ghost is." it's a it's a crew it's a team like they they all have 16 jobs and they know them very well um and so that was just really really cool to me to hear about how everything we see on stage has a very very meticulous and detailed build to how it actually happens including all the costume changes you do too yeah Mm -hmm. it does we it's a very uh uh well oiled machine Mm -hmm. and uh I like it like that. I mean, that's that's to echo what I spoke about earlier. You know, the the sort of flannel flannel shirt band that just comes up and just play and don't worry about anything. I mean, as a person, oh man, I wish I was in a band like that sometimes mm-hmm. because it's so much easier. Um, but on the other hand, it's very hard to do something mirroring what i have had in mind for like a a detailed show with a certain flow if you did the springsteen thing and just like ask the crowd what they want to hear and then you improvise the entire set list we could never do that uh and that is why everything is pretty rigid and and uh, uh synchronized and and premeditated if you will mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, also, I you know a lot of your fans uh, are in the chat right now, talking about uh, your concerts and telling you to come to Italy, come to Chile, uh, wherever uh, they want mm-hmm. you to be. But uh, one of the questions that someone was asking, which I, I'm definitely taking questions for everybody in the chat. One of them was actually, uh, uh, how do you take your coffee? This is uh, actually, uh, I don't know if I. I've, I've... Okay, I'm doing this for Duff then because he's. Uh, I know that he's money in this. This is Starbucks <laughs> coffee, uh, and uh, for years, uh, I am. I'm sort of. Um, I'm a little bit antsy about really warm things. I don't like. I easily burn, mm-hmm. and uh, for years, uh, I went into coffee shops saying like, "I want a coffee that's, um, like, can you have." this much milk in it and they were like okay cool and they they put in warm milk i'm like uh-huh. no 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 no. i need to, cold milk you want cold coffee you want iced coffee 
<laughs> coffee. I was like, no, I want it. Can you just, can you make me a latte? And when you have it filled up to here, you just pour that out and then just pour milk in it. That's, that's it. That's what I want. And they were like, you want iced coffee? <laughs> and I had conversations like that for years with people. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I don't know what's going on. I I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. So I always asked for coffee, and then I went, by, you know, by the bathroom, and just like poured out coffee and just and and had to fix it. And then at I was at a Starbucks at um, uh, right by the uh, Flatiron Building uh -huh. in New York. Uh, I think we were mixing Meliora because we were right there, mm -hmm. and uh, there was this guy. At, at inside the Starbucks, he was just like, "Just say kids temp." Kids temp. So this is a this is a latte wow. kids temp. That's how I like my coffee. I didn't even know they offered that. So uh, you heard it here first. Uh, the Tobias Forge order is a uh, is a kids temp coffee, a kids temp yeah. latte. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I I feel like I'm on the same wavelength as you because whenever I go get a, I mean, I'm not a coffee drinker. But anytime I get like a hot tea or anything, it's always way too hot. I was just burn mm. my entire lips and tongue on it every time. So I just like put it next to me for about 15 minutes and just don't touch it. And then I just drink it after that. It's the best way Great to do it. Great minds think alike. <laughs> mm -hmm. There you go. There you go. Hey. Uh, thank you for uh, expanding on your coffee tastes for all of us. Uh, it's some vital information. So thank you. <laughs> it's important. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I want to take it back to something you said a bit earlier about the sound of Ghost, which I, I think has been really, really unique over the years, transformative over the years. Um, given your history, I, I mean, I, I know you're in bands like Repugnant uh, for a little while, Crash Diet for a little while, and uh, given those kind of more, at least Repugnant, a little more harsher sound mixed with the Crash Diet, a little more like 1980s uh, glam, um, how did your loves of those kinds of music mix to form the music that you make right now? Uh, originally it was just an experiment. Mm -hmm. Um, when ghost, when the seeds of ghost were planted, um, it, it was, it came in a very pure form of a song mm -hmm. and, um, a song written as I think most songwriters uh, recognize this you, you sort of just play around you haven't you, you just play around with ideas and sometimes you come up with ideas that feels slightly detached from um like your current band or your current project mm -hmm. or per current projects and but they still might feel inspiring and and um this song uh at the time had uh, some power to it that i really liked and uh that ended up being stand by him mm -hmm. on the first album mm -hmm. and um what ended up happening was that uh i didn't have a studio myself and uh a friend of mine who i'd played with in previous bands both in repugnant and crash diet and subvision mm -hmm. But at the time, in 2006, we, we hadn't played anything together for, for a while. We weren't in, in the same bands anymore. And uh, I just asked him, I think we were going to hang out in the evening, and I just said, can I come by in the afternoon and just record something? Um, and he was like, yeah, cool. And, and you know, very quickly, like, oh, here's the like the drum beats that I want, and this just give me the bass, give me the guitar. And, and it was just it's, it's a quick sketch of, 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 of the song. And... Um, he said that this is great can we maybe we can do a band again mm -hmm. and i said well i mean this song came so intuitively and it's so odd or, or it feels <laughs> in my mind sort of revolutionary odd and compared to a lot of the other things that i'm so so in order for me to feel like that is a great idea i need to write a few more songs and see if there is more where that came from mm -hmm um yeah. and eventually there there were right and um i think that what really got me um enthused to continue writing it and eventually uh choosing to sort of set all the other projects aside and just focusing on this one thing mm -hmm. was the fluency mm -hmm. of writing 
it felt like it was really combining a lot of the things that I like. I I come from yeah, I mean, I I in in my adolescence and my my playing background comes from very extreme very noisy music. Mm-hmm. Um but I I grew up with a lot of melodic music. Right. Um and not only rock, it was uh, all kinds of pop stuff. Everything that was on the radio in, in, in the 80s, I've digested. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, I've, I've always had a, a, you know, a fascination for, for um, big vocal music. Mm-hmm. And with that, I mean everything from Toto to, to, uh, to gospel, to every, everything that has like a lot of strong, well-sung <laughs> vocals uh <laughs> with harmonies um look I, I i like johnny rotten too but um so i wanted to combine that mm-hmm. you know uh evil-esque music but with sort of an aor vibe to it yeah i mean given also the i feel like the theme that you selected and the theme that you started working with early on like um the music on like opus eponymous and uh Infestissimum, like all, all like it 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 is a trajectory it kind of like goes from one to the other and you see where the transformations happened you see kind of where your gears were turning in that direction um did did you was there any point that you really got comfortable in that um not persona but in that theme and in the ghost theme and the band theme because at a certain point it, it seems like it would be a limiting theme it seems like something that would be difficult to generate a lots of new ideas and new music from um, but you really have, and you've really expanded it into like a crazy place nowadays. Um, so I, I guess my question is, um, how did you grow comfortable expanding the themes of the band and where did you feel like it was best to grow? Great question. I don't really know. Um, I think when you're, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that every songwriter thinks like this, but I know a lot of songwriters that that aren't necessarily in bands. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'm not saying the 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 opposed from what I'm about to say is bad, but there is a certain there are a lot of bands in rock, punk, and and probably in in, in every genre that you can find that knows after a while that. If we just, this is the recipe that we're doing. That this, if we just do this, if it, if if we have four measures of this, four of that, and then uh, a bridge, mm-hmm. it's gonna be a song. Um, the same way that you know, as a as a lover of certain bands, but also as a somewhat able songwriter, mm-hmm. I can pretty easy. If you told me to like write write a song that sounds like Ramones. I can I write I write you a song that sounds like Ramon mm-hmm. and sing like and and you know and, <laughs> and and sort of make it sound like that. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that that wasn't the way that they did it, but there's there there in rock history. There's definitely a lot of bands that feels like they five six seven records in mm-hmm. you could hear that they start. They just know that if we if if we just start at nine o'clock by one o'clock we we will have half an album Mm -hmm. because we know that we don't have to do more than this if we just do that it's going to be we we will deliver Mm -hmm. especially if you're playing hard uh, hard and heavy music there's there's a certain degree of of persuasion um that you can that you can uh utilize by just making it really loud and really hard and a lot of people get their rocks up on that like oh it's so fast Mm -hmm. but i've always been i like a lot of raunchy music i like a lot of fast heavy aggressive music Mm -hmm. but if i sat here for a few hours and just played all the things that i like everything from necrovore that did one demo in 1987 that i absolutely fucking worship (laughs) to death to Metallica to ACDC to Ramones to Blondie uh, via, uh, you know, Atomic Swing. I could tell you why these songs are great because they're well written. 
they have a meaning, they have a purpose. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that regardless which kind of music style you have, you still need to write songs. And just because I have made a thing out of never really, really committing to um, like a certain drum beat mm -hmm. or a certain thing, um, and this is where I go. I go back now to where I think a lot of songwriters feel like. No, you can never do the same thing again. And every time you you record a new song or you write a new song, it feels like a your virginity all over again. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I don't know where it's going. Mm -hmm. It feels like this unwritten song that you're just trying to it feels it's, sometimes I, f I feel it's a little bit like being a detective. Songs are out there somewhere in the it's like a mystery. <laughs> That once you get a clue and you're like, oh, 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 and then you start sort of pulling a string out of the ground mm -hmm. and you try to excavate and see what it is because it's talking to you as a writer. Yeah, yeah That I doesn't mean, mean that you cannot control it, but it means that there is, if there's something wrong with the song, it will tell you. You will feel that there's something amiss or skewed with it that you need to fix. And that feels different every time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you want to write something that's really um, adventurous, and and sometimes you just want to write something that's super simple. Mm -hmm. And um, as much as it gives you great gratification when not only writing it and recording it and listening back to it, and then eventually, if you get people to say that they think it's good, um, every time you're going to do it again, it feels like this big the great unknown yeah <laughs> yeah no that i mean that makes a lot of sense i i feel like i, I like your allusion to detective work because um uh, oddly enough i i, I was going to talk briefly about uh, square hammer and uh I, I feel like songs that you have it feels like at least to me as like a fan and as like a, a long time listener it seems that songs where you kind of step out of the comfort zone a little bit try something new um like square hammer or um any tracks on Meliora, like when you had the like the guitar solo in Mummy Dust, and when you do Mariana Cross nowadays, like I feel like every time that you step to a different genre, get a little more psychedelic, even um, and like Go Goat and things like that, I feel like you you do gain more fans, and I feel like there is more appreciation for the music you make. And outside of what you do in Ghost, and outside what you do for yourself, um, is there any other music that you write that you mentioned before that you had written some music kind of outside of the bands that you were in? Is there any time that you have written music that's not for Ghost and it is just kind of on the side that you, you feel like you just need to do? Um, the last five, six years, I'd, I'd say that there was less of that. Mm -hmm simply because some of the songs that I've were ideas that I had for songs that I thought would automatically be for someone else or, or, or something outside of ghost mm. has turned out to be ghost songs. Mm. Um, and that that's, I would attribute that to me collaborating with people mm -hmm. because the way um, I started sort of, uh, was the word voyeuring? <laughs> um, when I started experimenting with with um, writing songs with others, mm. like professionally with p people that I you know I liked and 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 somehow you know we agreed that we were going to do something. Um, some of those ideas were songs that I had that I thought was going to fit better into the realm of what they were doing professionally like uh, a lot of my 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 best collaborations have been with people that aren't that may, might have used to be in bands or have bands on the side but are their main focus is just being songwriters and most of the time they write songs for really big pop artists mm -hmm. um and um i come you know uh in with something that i'm like look this sounds like a dance song, don't you think? And they're like, it sounds totally like a ghost song. <laughs> so let's do that. Okay. And, and, and then 
it sort of morphs into to uh and and, and that has in in one way one way uh of course it has padded me with with a lot of confidence that you know, i can sort of make almost anything into a ghost song but that also uh left the compass sort of like just spinning because that means that i can't really do the the whole uh recipe thing uh -huh. anymore i don't know I, i i mean anymore i've never really done it but i i can't settle on there is no recipe what what 40 minutes of a ghost record is mm -hmm. the way that no disrespect whatsoever that a lot of classic rock records are there are many 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 classic bands mm -hmm. have a go-to so sound that they can rely on mm -hmm. right and have mm -hmm. if you listen to a lot of the album number 13 15 and 18 mm -hmm. there's a lot of just regurgitation of that sound right right like that trademark sound that kind of follows them through their career Um, and I, I actually had a question about Impera. Uh, somebody in the chat wanted to know about your process uh, writing nowadays. I, I think uh, more pertinently, uh, what is your um, process writing on Impera as far as that album was concerned? What I do is I write all the time in, in the sense that I, as soon as I have an idea, I always try to memorize it somehow. An idea might not necessarily be a guitar riff. It might be a vocal line. It might be a an actual wor actual words, um, um, something like that. It might be a drum thing. It might be a keyboard thing. It might be a bass thing. Um, a lot of the songs are written on different instruments. Like from the pinnacle to the pit is written on a bass. Mm -hmm. um, Dies in absentia, um, uh, respite on the spittle fields, written on piano. Um, Whereas Cerise, I still have like the the first recording of that, which is me. I'm just swinging my my son or my daughter in 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 a playground, and then yeah, I just hear did 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 no, that's the uh, that's the rats. Uh, how is it? Do 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 and I have that sort of I just hum that in, and then that's like okay, that's that's one idea, and then I forget it. And then later, I just like, okay, so what's this idea? Recording 357. Okay, that's a great intro. Let's build that. So I just collect a ton of ideas like that. Mm -hmm. And when, ti when time comes for writing, as in, uh, which means nowadays recording, You know, back in the day, back in Repugnant, like uh, whenever I wrote a song, I always had to like write it first. I have to, had to learn it like and, and and sort of try to maintain the arrangement in my head. Sometimes you wrote up the arrangement uh, like it, it just said um, like verse one, uh, uh, the little thing, verse two, little thing plus the weird thing and it it was nothing nothing like scholastic about it whatsoever uh -huh. but i had to like mind map it so that i could get to rehearsals to band practice and then it's just like trying to keep the drummer from playing and just like okay so guitar player this is riff one da, 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 and then this this little thing da, 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 da. but but the second time it's da, 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 da. huh and then you had to sort of explain Drummer, shut up. Okay, bass player. When and you, drummer, can you please stop playing? And and it's like, ugh. And it was this this gigantic fucking endeavor, just trying to get right. everyone to play. Mm -hmm. And it, it worked. And I think every punk rocker or death metal musician ever has gone through this. And it's just a violent, uh, loud um, ordeal. I loved it in so many ways but holy shit the 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 violence your your ears had to take in order to just get through a song and get everybody to sort of play everything and lo and behold like three months later when you're in a studio cutting it so you, you notice that half of the band are sort of like playing the things wrong and uh so you have to fix things and it's just like a big mess um 
and that sort of lends itself to the to the uh <laughs> you know the ad- adolescent touch of of what was old school death metal whereas you know last 20 years 25 years maybe when people had studios at, at, in their homes you hardly rehearse that way you don't write songs like that anyway n- anymore you record the song and then you play it for people this is how the song goes and then we can arrange it or we can do something with it but this is what i'm trying to get you to play right mm-hmm. which was a big difference um so where was i going with that um you you have all these ideas written down recorded hummed in um i i memorized things and then you you come to a point when it's time to sort of put everything together and um sometimes i mean over the course of of our career obviously i've i've spent a lot of time writing everything but when i um started inviting people to write with me mm-hmm. uh what we ended up doing was i take a few i i place a few ideas in in some sort of pre- presentable fashion and i usually try to show two different things and basically i show and then say which one do you like which one do you want to work on mm-hmm. and that person or persons usually say that one i think that one is the best mm-hmm. okay and then we start working and as soon as i get time with someone else who comes in with a clear mind and 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 you know enthusiasm that gets my motor going as well mm-hmm. that's a very inspiring thing and and uh I like writing on my own as well but it's um uh, <laughs> it's kind of like an American pie you know <laughs> if you play ping pong you you know you sometimes you want to have someone like returning the ball right <laughs> right um or something to the to the effect of that so uh but both is fun mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think um something else I, I wanted to know um Thank you for the American Pie reference that made my day. Um, there's something I, I want you uh, want to know from you is that a lot of people in the, the chat have been also talking about costuming and kind of all of the aesthetics that that boils down to in the band. Because I think, you know, from prequel to Impera, there's a change, right? From uh, Infosysimum to prequel, I mean, to Meliora, there's a change uh, in terms of persona, but also in terms of appearance. Um what is the process of changing that appearance, getting the new costumes done, just uh, the real nitty gritty of uh, actually changing the appearance of the band uh, for every era? Um, it always feels like a very big thing because in the beginning, it was very amateurishly made mm-hmm. and and uh, as as we started um shifting and and started um really having to sort of reinvent what the band looked like every time uh you're not only up against aesthetics you're also up against practicality mm-hmm. uh, and every album cycle you learn album cycle for for the reader or listener it's it's like from when the album comes out and you do the tour uh, the the year of touring and then when the last <laughs> uh, date of the tour is that's the, the album cycle mm-hmm. um the tour cycle and um you you end up uh, more than often like something that was a really great idea on paper comes back pretty pretty um harshly quickly when the tour starts it's like i can't see through this mask i can't breathe through through this mask oh you is that important uh yes okay (laughs) and then you have to fix that and then (laughs) and and then you know i remember like last last cycles i think you know there was this issue where um like the masks just because of just because there was a differentiation between female and male mm-hmm. um in in as to what they looked like um i think one of them ended up weighing a lot more mm. 
um, which is something that you sort of not think about when you come up with the idea. But ergonomically, it turned out to be um, a little bit of an exercise for the girls who had to sort of strengthen their, their necks a little in order to... I mean, it worked, but there, there's a lot of that that sort of goes in. So now when, when we're slowly, slowly, slowly sort of getting into album number six, my mind, you know, I'm already sort of writing for that. I'm already sort of planning for that. And and then you, you have a lot of notes like, okay, so don't do those boots. Don't, you can't do that. Oh, we need to make sure that the material uh, is changed so they don't won't go gray after three weeks. There's a lot of things like that. So for every time you, you do it again, there's a, a lot of, of, of notes and, and changes that have to be, that, that, ha that will alter your, your uh, decision that it's purely um, practical, mm -hmm. not, a, not, not necessarily aesthetic, aesthetical, aesthetic, <laughs> however you bend that. Um, you, you mentioned uh, a few uh, really fun things there. Uh, when you talk about um, next album, I guess it's always a, always a buzz term. I feel like a buzz phrase uh, for the, for the new direction, I guess. Cause I, I mean, it all really hinges on a lot of your creativity and a lot of where you want the band to go. Um, wh where do you want the band to go next in terms of possibly thematics or um, even sound? Uh, anything you've been inspired by lately that um, excites you for the next step? Nothing that I can commit to here and now. I mean, I know there there are a lot of things in my head and, and that I feel like I want to explore. Mm -hmm writing and 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 um i think i think i've never really ended an album production without or left an album production without feeling like there are things that i would want to do different next time mm -hmm. um kind of like what, what i just said about costumes you 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 try to uh slowly and steadily you try to perfect uh, but for every process, you end up doing some sort of experiment that might have been a miracle or the next time you're like, oh, so let's never do that again. Um, because recording and writing and, and, and just making a record is also uh, it's a boring thing, but it's it's actually a very it's there's there's a lot of practical factors that will play into the result of the of, of making a record. Historically, you can, you can, if we, if we don't talk about my band, but just historic records, it's like there's a big difference between recording uh, in in your hometown and recording a record on, you know, a tropical island someplace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. I, I mean, and and none none of them is better than the other. It just it just means two different things, and um, people that you work with and what state of mind you are in when you're doing it and if you work at night or if you do work in daytime <laughs> you know there are so many things like that and so right now I'm, I'm 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 more about vibing like i'm trying to build a new vibe for writing this record now mm. um you know um just to sort of see to it that i don't end up repeating myself mm -hmm. Yeah, and do something else, and just uh, you know, evoke a few of the good things from from past, and try to eradicate some of the things that I didn't like, mm -hmm. and uh, once more, you try to do it perfectly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like being that sort of person that gets married from six times. Like this time, it's really going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> going to be perfect this time. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. He's the one. Yeah. <laughs> There's no other person. For, yeah, exactly. Um, can't believe I found another one. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I, I wanted to talk to you a bit about also uh, the technical side of things, right? So I, I think we talked about the thematics, but on the uh, music side of things, and specifically more on your vocal side of things, because I, I think we've seen a, a big transformation in your vocals uh, on music early and music new from Opus Eponymous to Impera. Um, how do you think your vocals have transformed? Uh, or maybe how do you think the songs have transformed to change your vocals in a way? Practice mm -hmm. has changed a lot. Uh, I've never really taken any lessons. Um, 
the the few lessons that I've taken has been you can count them on one hand with two fingers. And um one of them was because I had totally lost my voice. So I had to have like a vocal coach coming in and just to sort of get it started. Mm-hmm. Um and um other than that I've never really had a vocal coach to to, to sort of teach me things i've i've sort of learned myself um and obviously practiced a lot um uh, but of course i you know i don't know how many s- s- shows we've done but 800 maybe something like that and of course that change that changes your technique however one one thing that has always been a little bit annoying to me is that um i i tend to do a lot of um progression mm-hmm. when i'm in the studio that will um um enhance range or technique um uh, just because the song needs it so you know you, you try to nail something and then all of a sudden you're like oh I, i i didn't know i could sort of do do it like that and uh, then because of you know obviously most music nowadays is not like one take wonders you sort of uh we try not to to sort of fix it but obviously uh-huh. you you do it many many times so you do it like a very and obviously i i do a lot of dubbing as they say uh classic joe ramon thing <laughs> uh you know you you sort of sing everything three times and that that's why it sounds that sort of uh sounds chorusy like that right and um so you end up singing every hard part many 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 times so you have it stacked up and layered so you have those three perfect takes that will gel together very well um and then all of a sudden you know when i go out on tour and um um singing through a mask is not great i can tell you that yeah that yeah. makes you sort of that that puts a limiter onto vocals uh pretty dramatically mm-hmm. which is uh kind of annoying I think something I also wanted to ask you kind of on that wavelength is uh around uh kind of the new sounds that I feel like I was listening to Impera when it came out and I feel like I I was listening to the songs and I was like oh that's a new sound that's a new vocal unlocked I think uh one of those in particular was um the first note on Kaiserian when you're kind of yelling to introduce the song at such a high pitch that I was like I had no idea that that was a capability um for something like that specifically can you tell me about um doing that in the studio and recording that a few times over uh i think that is a perfect example of what we just talked about yeah. like um for as long as i've had kaiserian in my head um as a big sort of fast opener um i always sort of envision this big screen um first as a placeholder uh i on, on the demo you know i wanted to have like Roger Daltrey the scream that he does on uh is it won't get fooled again won't I get fooled again yeah that uh-huh. yeah sort of like just just destroys his voice uh-huh uh that would have been like the best there um and uh you know even to the point where i was like are we at a level where we can sort of ask him to come do it or <laughs> should we sample his thing or no what are we, what are we going to do and and floss the producer he was just like just try <laughs> just try to do it obviously it didn't end up being the same thing but you know when you start um experimenting with something like that it just you try to find um something new uh that it's at least is you mm-hmm. and uh i'm glad that we did it that way um i think it ended up cool uh i'm not like uh i'm not like rob halford you know you can do a lot of that Wah! you know I, i don't do a whole lot of that stuff um So uh yeah it felt like 
a new thing but th that's that's the thing with ghost as well like for for being like a metal hard rock band mm -hmm. we're doing a lot of things backwards like one of the big right. things for this record that we just made number five was that we had two double we had double kicks mm -hmm. which is like fundamental per, like fundamental metal oh, is yeah. to have like double kick no 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 on our first record we had like a complete appetite for destruction drum kit it was yes. like one bass drum one snare and one uh tom it was like the <laughs> minimal like the most minimal kit because i had this idea i really want you know i yeah, i'm a big fan of appetite for destruction i wanted that sort of simple uh caveman sort of uh, setup and then for every record we've expanded and i remember someone asking me something similar to what you just said a, a question or two ago probably just one question ago because i've been ranting for a while um like what are the things that we're adding for the new record i was like a double kick drum Ooh, fun yeah <laughs> oh that's exciting that's exciting I, yeah. I like the evolution there because you know you measured before you listen to stand by him it opens up with that um drum so i not solo but drum track and uh, you, you just kind of are taken with the simplicity of it. And I think that was really the charm. And I, I like how it's transformed now into possibly double kick, possibly an evolution each time, getting a little more complex, but also the melody is still there. And I, I really enjoy that. It's really cool. Yeah. 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 I was like, from a Colin Eric point of view, it's kind of trying to if you sort of take people to, the, to, uh, to a, a remote, maybe isolated island and you're just... There's nothing but sand here and then you sort of introduce like salt you know yeah right. but you sit there with like parsley and stuff and but but you sort of give him that every year you sort of <laughs> add something to it like make a fire and you don't have to eat raw meat we can actually like make turn it like crusty slowly blowing your drummer's mind every every year every album <laughs> <laughs> yeah with one new tom like, at a oh time my god there's a tom that stands on the floor that's incredible <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, that's my uh, thing yeah there are tobias I, I have so many more questions for you uh but not enough time unfortunately but i do have a few more things that um, have been pouring in from chat and other things uh, for the future. But uh, from the chat, um, I, there's been a lot of talk, maybe from the same person, but maybe from multiple sources. I haven't been looking really, really closely. But um, everybody wants to know about Mary Gore. Uh, what's the mm -hmm. um, what's the timeline on a possible return? If there is going to be a return, well, what do you think about it? The return of Mary Gore. Mm -hmm. I don't have a timeline for it. But he's somewhere. Mm -hmm. Or they. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I, yeah, I can't really. I have a lot of things on my plate. But not ruling anything out. Cool. It's good to hear. Um, I, I think last thing I wanted to know from you is uh, just generally in your listening habits, um, have there been any artists that you have come to really really enjoy lately or any artists old and new um that you have really found a love for and appreciation for uh recently mm, my most recent um turnaround i would say is marillion <laughs> mm -hmm. which uh, yeah it's, it's and and th these are records from the, the early to mid 80s so it's like doesn't feel very re re revolutionary, but for me it was a big thing because I uh, ended up um, from, um, I mean, I've known about them forever and I never really liked it. I always thought when I listened to it, it sounded like Spinal Tap, but without the jokes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it wasn't even funny. <laughs> and I love Spinal Tap, but but part of what makes it so great was that, that it was really fun, fun, fun lyrics. As, as as well as funny fun and uh you know playful music and uh so that's what i thought marillion was and then all of a sudden i just had this epiphany it was like wow this is great great records cool. um and, and and i think that that was the biggest turnaround for me just because i felt like <laughs> i can't believe i missed i what what, what was i listening through mm -hmm. kind of wax thing that i have in my ear 
up until I finally uh, understood. Yeah. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing, isn't it? Uh, things, you know, don't, that don't hit you in one way one year may hit you in a completely different way another year and change like that yes. over time, which is really great. Um, Tobias, I, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us today. I, I wanted to say just as a huge fan myself, uh, thank you for continuing to put out some of the most genre changing music that I've heard in the past 10 years. And it's been such a pleasure talking with you. And we'd love to speak with you. Um, when you're on your tour, if you're in New York at any time, let us know. We'd love to have you on the show in person. I would love to come by. Great. Thank well, you Tobias, uh, good luck also at the AMAs in two days. Good luck at the Grammys this year. Mm. Congratulations on the nominations. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah, looking forward to that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. All right, everybody. That was Tobias Forge. Um, I, I don't know why I can even say. Uh, I had a great time speaking with him. First time I got to talk to him, and I was very happy to do so. Uh, thank you to all the uh, ghost fans, the guesties. I didn't see. I've been such a fan for like ten years, and I had no idea <laughs> that that was the name of the fandom. To be honest, uh, but thank you, thank you, guesties. I guess for coming by. Uh, it's been such a pleasure talking with y'all. Uh, we're gonna go to a quick ad. When we come back, we will have Paolo Nutini here live in person, and then we're gonna watch him perform right after that. So stick around, everybody, if you want to discover some a new music if you don't know paolo but if you do uh you're gonna love it i swear yeah don't, um, don't go you don't want to miss this performance you now want to miss here's, it here's a little oh taste. man it looks so fun here's a little taste of what we're we'll getting into in a little bit so <laughs> don't go anywhere don't go anywhere <laughs> love that yes uh and we'll see you back here in uh, just a minute i think we're just gonna get set up with the uh, with paolo yep. over here all right thank you all 